Hello folks, I'm glad to be here again bringing you this uh, content today on, um, on my episode. I'm talking again about the issues that are affecting the economy of South Africa, um, the issues that we started with last time we spoke was with regards to the looting, um, widespread unemployment, and, and, and the underlying factors um, that led to the f fermentation of what we saw in those forgettable two weeks in what has been deemed the most violent episode in free South Africa since South Africa became a, a democratic state. So I just wanted to, I would say that uh, my initial thought was that this video is going to be about the past 30 years but then in my preparation for that I changed my mind when I realized that I actually need to cover the period before 94 so that I can actually be able to situate our discussion in a, in, in a context that will make sense to people because um, it just flows better that way and it makes much better sense also, even, even with the solutions that can be suggested, it could be better if we understand what came before that. So in the late 80s to 90s, the country had, had entrenched unemployment, out-of-control poverty, and inequality. And uh, economic growth for the South African economy, which was had markedly slowed down since the early 70s, all the way early 70s, all the way to the late 80s. The economy was very bad in South Africa. There was slow growth, there was declining investment, there was rising unemployment. Um, rural areas were being degraded at a rapid pace um, and unacceptable levels of inequality. And the question really on my mind then would be, what then was the ANC planning to, to do to deal with all these issues as a government in waiting? I'm going to use this phrase as the government is waiting. Um, not in relation to a certain political party that calls itself a government in waiting. Um, because, but I do suspect that they are also calling themselves a government in waiting and they will fall to the same challenges and pitfalls that we saw and we see the NC fell to in the late 80s to early 90s. So what was the NC planning? To, how was the NC planning to deal with these issues? Um, so I took some liberty to, to check what was the NC thinking at the time, what was the, I mean, speeches, writings about economic policy, what exactly what were they thinking, what, what was their plan? going forward. And it turns out that the NC devoted no attention, virtually no attention at all, to the question of economic policy post apartheid. Um, such that when, when the NC was banned in February 1990, it had nothing in terms of economic policy other than the 1955 Freedom Charter, which had some economic issues. But, but other than that 1955 document, nothing. Um, so so, so as, as, the 90s, as the 80s were winding down and, and the unrest was, was out of control in South Africa and international pressure on the National Party government was, was rising, it became clear that the apartheid government is going to come to an end soon. It became untenable. So even before the NC was unbanned, it was clear that the, um, around the late 80s that um, as soon as FWD started conversations with the NC leadership that, okay, this is coming to a close. So the NC then started to, to, to realize that they need some form of economic plan that is coherent. Um, so in this spirit, then the NC scrambled the conference in 1988, which was called the NC 1988 
constitutional guidelines. And in this conference, ladies and gentlemen, what variety of policy issues were discussed, and amongst them, economic policy. However, the issues around economic policy were, very, were vague at best and outright confusing. Um, and in and, and some instances, contradictory. Um, and at worst, it was filled with lots of obfuscation. Um, so, so these were the early signs that of what was to come in the next 30 years, which, which I'm going to call in a video that I'm going to do later as decades, as 30 years of policy obfuscation, as that there were signs around the late 80s that ANC leaders, the thinkers around the ANC in their alliance and the alliances, and they, they were really not clear in terms of what sort of economic direction they wanted to take. So also, folks, you remember that the Freedom Charter, which I said is being the, the NC policy document, was also, well, it's still a document that exists, vague on specifics. And I mean, vague and uh, devoid of specifics, as the term I was looking for. Um, so, so, so the Freedom Charter was more of a, of, a, of a demands list as opposed to a concrete policy document. Um, and, and, and that was the only thing that the ANC had. And then now in 1988, that other obfuscation of the document, um, uh, guidelines or whatever. Um, and then again, in 1990, when it became clear now that um, I mean they've been unbanned, um, uh, that okay the NC is probably going to be the next government, a second attempt at some form of economic policy formation was attempted by the NC. They gathered, they met, they deliberated issues. They released a document called um, the Economic Policy Draft in September of 1990. Again, filled with, a, with a, it was just a confusing mess. The answer was soon going to realize and to learn a difficult lesson. What is this lesson? This lesson was that you cannot govern with one line talking points. You cannot govern with slogans. You need to you govern with a clear, coherent, understandable policy. Slogans are great for electioneering. Slogans are, are great for campaigning. But slogans are not policy. Um, and, 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 and that's something that it seems to me that the ANC in the past 30 years have not learned because they've le <laughs> this was the challenge that they were facing then. Well, it seems they're still having that same challenge now. Which brings me back to, because I'm saying context is everything. Um, I had to think about this for a second and think that if I were to be magnanimous towards the ANC. I would say that it is probably unfair and unreasonable, unrealistic to expect that men, a group of men who spend half of their adult life in prison when they leave prison that they will have they will have the capacity, mental capacity, mental ability, and know how of formulating a clear economic policy that can govern a country that was facing challenges as significant as South Africa was facing at the time. 
so folks, because the, the fact of the matter is that it was not the, the, the issue of the fact that a lot of black South Africans were totally um, left out of the economic process. It was also the fact that that um, even after you've, you've began that transformation process, if you want to call it that, you will still be left with millions of South Africans who don't have jobs and who have never had jobs. And you need to have solutions that go beyond slogan, slogans and electionary. And so I actually, I, I don't imagine that Nelson Mandela was, was spending time in Robben Island reading Milton Friedman or reading John Keynes. I don't, I don't imagine that's what he spent his time doing. So I, I'm, I can imagine that he, the guy was probably not prepared to face and, and not, not, not ready to deal with the questions that he was supposed to deal with at a time when the country was going to look to him to lead through that difficult time. So not just him, all of them, um, including our current president, Cyril Maposa, who was at the time um, part of the, I mean, he was, he was, a, he was a high ranking NC member at the time who was actually supposed to be the deputy president, but that's different for another day, but he was a high ranking member leading the, 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 the Kosato at the time. Um, so they were all of them not prepared. I mean, Jacob Zuma had not gone to school, so we understand that Jacob Zuma had no schooling education. They had no schooling at all, had no background in a, a, any formal education. So there is no way that you could have, I, I, even in the eight years that Jacob Zuma was president of South Africa, to expect that Jacob Zuma would have had had a clear economic plan for job for job creation and wealth creation for black people. It's just unthinkable. So even with with with, with Tavon Bailey, who we know that he studied economics in the UK, you still need to have a culture of economic debate within a, a, a organization, not have or one person say, oh, here he is, he's got an economics degree. There's a lot more to it than just having one guy having an economics degree. Um, um, because in terms of formulating a clear and coherent economic plan requires, especially in, 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 in the governing system that we have, where, where, we rule, where parties rule by consensus, there has to be a consensus building in, this, in these policies. Let me make an example this way. When China, when the, when the Chinese m go and meet with global leaders, when they meet with the IMF or the World Bank, or when they meet to negotiate trade with the United States of America or with the EU. Whoever is sent in that delegation is sent with clear objectives in terms of what it is that the Chinese, what it is that the Communist Chinese Party wants to accomplish. And I'm not using here the Chinese Party as some sort of example of how to govern you because we know that they are a genocidal dictator that is abusing them. I'm just saying that, I mean, there are certain things that they are doing that are working. Oh, for instance, that I mean, for, they're very clear in terms of what it is that they want, and they are getting what they want. But I'm saying that when they send a delegation to, to negotiate, they send them with a clear mandate in terms of what it is that they want. And so it is very difficult. It was going to be very difficult for South Africa and, and Nelson Mandela and all those guys, or Governor Begi, or Tasisulu, um, Chris Hani, uh, Sir Ramaphosa, Tabon Begi, all of them, all of them, all of them. Um, some, to, to, to be able to, when they are when they're now engaging with, with for instance, even with the National Party or engaging with the IMF or engaging with, with the World Bank, this is pre-94 now, um, and engaging with, with, with other interest groups that were interested in the success of South Africa, but they had their own interests in South Africa. It was going to be difficult for the NC to negotiate with them from a, from a position of strength because the NC was economically ignorant. So e economically ignorant and the NC didn't really... They didn't even understand um, these economic principles. So when you're going to negotiate and you don't even know what you don't know, it, it's, it's highly unlikely that you're going to get what you want because you don't even know what it is that you want. So, so, so basically what I'm saying with regards to this is that, is that apart from the fact that the NC knew that they wanted political freedom for, for South Africans and maybe economic freedom, not stealing from the EFF, but in terms of 
South Africans, Black South Africans part- participating in the economy uh, and being economically a- active. Um, it, it was this entire process was dead on arrival. Was dead on arrival in the sense of saying that, in my mind, it is actually a miracle that South Africa has 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 survived so long without having an economic collapse. Because you cannot have a bunch of people who didn't have an economic policy at the beginning. I mean, I'm still going to talk about the economic policies that they, they said in the before, like the RDP, comfort. Uh, we're going to touch on that. It, it, it's, it's difficult to have a bunch of people who didn't know what they were doing govern a country for 30 years and not have it collapse. So which is why I'm saying that, which is why I'm saying that it is a miracle that South Africa has not collapsed so far. South Africa has been staring at the abyss for the past 30 years. Um, so so that, that South Africa has been dancing and teetering around disaster for the past 30 years. Because, because, um, because the governing party or the people, the people that 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 South Africans would have entrusted to govern, were just not capable. Um, they didn't have the ability to think through the issues of what are we going to do with the issue of unemployment. Let me talk about, for instance, that I mean, like, we have, of course, we have to admit that there, there have been some changes. There's been a rise in black middle class. There's been a rise in even in some black millionaires, but the, the progress has been painfully slow to the point that I mean we talk about how labor partic- participation in the past twenty years has not changed. I have to say that, say for instance, the instant government took control of ESCOM, Transnet, Petrosa, Denal, SABC, and then they filled all these companies with black people. And then now you have municipalities which were not there before we have all these local governments that were not there which are also all run by black people by now so doing you've created a black middle class that can actually exist and function in this space of middle classism but the problem with that is that if you if you add all of these black jobs that has been created through a black government controlling ASCOM um, uh, and, and controlling transnet, you might go up as far as at the peak. I think it was five hundred thousand at some stage around ninety nine five hundred thousand jobs, which is a lot. Um, and, and I think right now it's around two hundred thousand, which is also still a lot, which explains why the PSC has over trillion rands in terms of money that they they managing public sector pensions, but it's still for another. So you have 200,000 people, black people, who, are, who have these middle class jobs in these companies because of the end of, 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 of economic exclusion. And you have 10 million, 20 million black South Africans who have no job prospects at all. So you still need to deal with the fact of saying that you need economic policy that goes beyond just Replacing a white guy at ESCOM with a black guy. Replacing a white engineer with a black engineer. I'm not going to talk about the pros and cons of, of transformation and be in affirmative action. Assuming that that's what's being done, which is in some sense what's being done. You're not going to deal with the fact that the, the, the fact of matter is that because there's a limit in terms of how many ex- ESCOM jobs are available, how many transnet jobs are available. So even if you were to nationalize banks, for instance, as some people are pontificating, you still have a limit <laughs> in terms of... Um, so you, 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 you cannot redistribute jobs that do not exist. There has to be jobs, open jobs that need to be filled. Um, so which is why I'm saying that... Like, that, that in, the, in this entire 30 years that the SC has not been able to deal with the question of saying, how do you create something from nothing? 
How do you create jobs where there are no jobs? How do you create wealth where there is no wealth? Because that is the kind of question and it is the kind of policy question that is needed that goes beyond the saying of saying we want shares in Um, or, or, or that we want whatever it is that people say they want. You still need to be a country that is creating stuff um, that doesn't um, and, and not only creating stuff but also be a country that, that is an environment where creating stuff is a culture um, and, and it requires economic policy certain kind of labor policies certain kind of fiscal policies certain kind of trade policies um, it's all sort of kind of policy categories that the NC has had 30 years to think about and um, that they felt, but in, in, in a sense of saying that in 1989, 1988 to 19, 1993, it was very clear that the NC was swimming in waters that were just way, that, that they were just like, they were drowning. They were drowning. So, so, so then when so when they were meeting these men wearing black suits that cost two thousand dollars from the IMF, it's unlikely that they would have negotiated anything that would have worked towards helping South Africa get to where South Africa needs to get. Um, because most of these guys did not even know what the question is, and let alone the answer. And and so. And then and, 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 and so we've been and then we'll be stuck then in this in, in this constant cycle of the outside world wants South Africa to manage its debt. Um and, and it's just like the okay, just keep it stable. Keep it stable and by keeping it stable mean don't have a civil war, don't have an uprising, but there are no jobs being created, there's no wealth being created, there's no actual change being made. Um which which has 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 basically been a consistent and persistent theme even through those Tom Beggy so called high growth years. You know how those high growth years, how the, the DA last to talk about how all oh, those high growth and and, and, and the and, and, and the Tom Big years. The thing about those high growth Tom Big years was that it is now what economists call jobless growth. So, if, if South Africa had an economic growth of, of 6%, or say 10% every year, that resulted in no changes in unemployment, it is useless. If we have a, 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 jo- a economic growth of 6%, that does not result in material changes in wealth creation among black South Africans, that too um, is 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 useless. It doesn't take us anywhere. So, so which is why then I'm am saying that South Africa from ninety from the very beginning from when the time the NC before the NC took power when the time the NC was 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 deliberating within themselves about which which po- policy positions they're gonna take. South Africa has been looking at disaster for thirty years, and it is, it is, it is a miracle. It is a miracle. You cannot have people who are so incompetent run a country for so long, and not have the country um, collapse. Um, so, which is why it is it is actually high time that change needs to happen. Thank you very much for tuning in. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the comment section below. Thank you very much. This is Vishenge. I'll see you next time, whenever that next time may be.